Don Copy, what's up? What's going on, man? Chilling, chilling. Excited to have you here today. We met at the Vault Conference down here in South Florida. Yeah. And you had a lot of really interesting perspective on the future of media. Yep. And media is changing tremendously. Sorry, LA. Sorry, NYC. It's, you're, you're dead. I don't know what to tell you. You got to get here to South Florida, Dade County, Fort Lauderdale, Broward County, Palm Beach. And I, I think one of the best ways to start here is talking about Vision X Media. Yeah. You and Alan Nuncio building up Vision X Media. So tell me a little bit about your vision with that company yeah. and why you think South Florida is the best place to be for that. Yeah, absolutely. So so Alan actually right now is is out in LA and he's planning on, you know, making some shifts because Miami is the spot, right? So um, he and I recently partnered up about two months ago. He gave me a call. He saw that I um, had left uh, with VT, with e. picked up my camera and started filming entrepreneurship style content for individuals. So sitting down with them, maybe somebody like yourself and getting reels, you know, ready for Instagram to post to grow everything that they're doing in their media. And, uh, you know, personalized media is a big thing. Uh, I saw Pat do it. I saw Andy do it. I saw Alex Hermosi do it to grow their company exponentially over time. And uh, I, I had reached out to Alan a little while back and said, hey, you know, let's make something happen. Then he called me and uh, we've now partnered up in Vision X. And Vision X big goal is to take on the biggest projects or new media projects. So Alan's one of the most, he is the most talented director, editor of new media style content. And I'll explain what that means. Big podcasts, Andrew Tate, PBD one and two, Khabib interview, PBD, uh, Tom Brady, the stuff that's going to be coming out uh, from the vault conference. I've seen him do it firsthand now. And he takes about 24 hours for a turnaround, you know, 20, 24 hours, 48 hours for a turnaround once he has all the materials. And it's unbelievable, the finished product, what he's able to do. The other side of the company is we do events. So, you know, the Vault Conference 2021, uh, I was there, you know, on BT. I know that they picked their own team to, to do a lot of the content. 2022, they picked Allen. And uh, the, the increase in attendance after they picked Allen for 2022 went up to 2023 by almost triple the size of the event. Because the marketing really showcased every detail of he's good at taking seemingly unconnected footage and making an amazing narrative of what the event is like. When you watch it, you, you feel, you taste, you smell everything. And he's also very good at audio. And a lot of people don't know that audio is actually a major, major component of doing this videography because it, it, it allows you to connect with what's going on in the space. So those are the two things, you know, big podcasts with very important people, make it look like it's a Netflix original and events event, event filming. And, and where are we talking about pushing out this content? Because historically you had all these gatekeepers on cable television. If yeah. you weren't on cable, you didn't matter. If you weren't on the big screen, you didn't matter. But now we're seeing the rise of streaming, the rise of podcasting. Yeah. YouTube is huge. Rumble, big up and comer. I think they actually have one of their, their major studios. Their headquarters might actually be here yeah. in South Florida. Possibly. If I'm not mistaken. I'm, yeah. You have to fact check me on that. Fact check. But I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. So where, where is the place to be pushing out this content? Yeah, I mean, there's different strategies that I use um, when I'm pushing out content for the people that I work with. I know Alan uses those strategies as well. Um, you know, you have so many different platforms, right? So you put out different styles of content that you get from a large framework or a large body of work, maybe from like a long, long podcast or big event, you take all that and then you're able to modify the content per outlet, right? So if you're talking about doing shorts on TikTok, YouTube, um, Instagram, and then you're talking about doing the bigger framework on YouTube, which really should be your biggest driver. If you have a large YouTube channel, you basically are the biggest in media right now, which uh, is the reason why people like CoffeeZilla, PBD, um, people aspire to be them. Even if they have their Instagram figured out and they have their other funnels figured out through like people like Russell Brunson, they still need to figure out how to get that YouTube uh, solved for. And there's different strategies that we can talk about that I think really apply to YouTube. One of which is Mr. Beast's main focus, which is just always create really, really good content. If you create massively good content and you just work on making sure that the quality of the footage is better, that you're including bigger and bigger people, uh, you're doing very innovative ideas that captivate people, then your content should, in theory, blow up like his did, going from lesser uh, good content to now he does all these massive shoots uh, as you've seen the squid games video went how viral we're talking hundreds and hundreds of millions of views 
because he focuses on good content. And there's also free. Well, I, yeah. I got to just comment on Mr. Beast. The, one, the other thing that he does that's brilliant is he keeps you watching till the end. Yeah. He's like, stay tuned to the end where we do the giveaway. He's got this big reveal. The other thing that Mr. Beast does that I think most people don't recognize yep. is he's distributing not just in English. So you might see 400 million views, 250 million views on a video, but that's just in English. He's yep. producing in, I want to say, 50 different languages. Yeah. So it's that times times X, which, you know, I think for the average creator is maybe not going to happen. But that's, I think, a big part of the brilliance. You know, it's funny we talk about YouTube because I really think that a lot of people are underestimating it. I've been in podcasting just about five years now. Yeah. And there's a lot of this old school mentality that people don't listen to podcasts on YouTube. What are you people talking about? What are you talking about? In, in fact, leading up this event, so we, we left the Vault Conference. You and I were talking, we're thinking big. And I, I want to have the go-to studio in South Florida. I want people to be like, okay, I'm, I'm flying in. I got to stop by the Savant studio. I got to be there. I got to record that. That's the vision. And so one of the steps to get there is starting recording more content in person, which is exactly what we're doing here, by the way. You'll notice this is a different studio. I connected with my man, Jeremy Norfus down here in South Florida. But I'm looking at all these studios and they're all recording on iPhones, dude. I'm like, how can I be serious about recording for YouTube, if I'm recording on an iPhone, and you know what I was told is, well, people don't listen to podcasts on YouTube. People yeah. don't, people don't consume, is that, is that heresy? Is it's, that it, lunacy? It's just, it's just wrong. It just, it's just completely wrong because there, there's different elements as to why, you know, uh, Pat scaled the operation the way that he did, um, with that, that I saw being on the, the, you know, working with Patrick for almost a year and in, in eight months, close to two years. So about a year and eight months working with VT, mostly on the consulting and business side. And, and I'm so grateful. I, I can't even tell you how grateful I am to Pat for taking me under his wing and teaching me a lot and grateful to the whole company, everybody involved. I love them very much. I'm the biggest, you know, biggest fan. My bag is, is VT. My hat is VT. I mean, shouts out to those people because they're the best people I ever met in media, right? And they're doing big, big things. But part of the reason why is that a lot of people when they're making content don't realizing that they're falling in the footsteps of just the old media companies. So you have this decentralization of media that occurs as we can pick up our phones and cameras get better. And then people just try to hop into content and they think they can do it like that. But right. this is nothing new, right? This is just a shift in the paradigm. But when you go to New York, like I did, you know, growing up, my, my uncle was a big movie critic out in Hollywood, produced Chicago Today, graduated Northwestern uh, University, started their whole journalistic program, started their news program. Um, he was my idol growing up. I don't know, even know if he knows that, but he was my idol growing up. And we were on news sets with him and, and he had his own TV show in Miami before it shifted to Telemundo and he kind of got kicked out um, and, and also was out in LA. So when I was 10, I met Adam Sandler, Keanu Reeves, Sandra Bullock, because he was interviewing him in for their movies at the time. And he was doing all this cool, creative stuff. But because I got to see that, and because I went to New York with my family quite often, I saw Fox Studio. I saw CNN Studio. I saw all these major studios in New York, you know, right by Rockefeller Center. They'll blow you away. If you try to approach it in a different manner besides that, you just, you don't look professional. You don't have an appeal. Part of people's psychology is the reason why they have those big studios is to show that the content that you're putting out is valid and that it has funding and that you're smart. So if you try to go into a podcast studio and it's based off phones, the audio isn't great and the visual isn't great, nobody's going to take you seriously. You know, that, that's why so much should be invested into the set. If you have the money and you want to start media and you want to start your own content, invest in a set. I, I have mad respect for a guy from the VT network, Paul Galoshkin. He's working on his content, coming up with better topics. But the one thing that this guy did first was buy a set and build it. He's a big, big, big real estate guy out in California. Him and his wife are awesome. They were at the vault. But he invested a lot of money into the set day one. He's got like a PB style, PBD style set in his home. It's unbelievable. But you know, I, did, I don't think that's enough. Spotify just canceled Michelle Obama. They just canceled Harry and Megan. I mean, these are $100 million deals. And there's like, eh, we just it's not working. Yep. It's not working. So I, I think about what's the differentiator because you're seeing the smaller type studios. Like, I'm not, I don't want to call Pat Studio small, but you, he started small. He started just in his office. Started in Boca. Well, started in, 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 LA, in right? Dallas, in, in Dallas, maybe some when he was in, you know, in LA. 
out at the time, then did a lot of work in Dallas, built the studio out with the big Hulk and all that stuff in the background, made it look super sick. And then they actually had uh, somewhat of a downsizing of the studio size when they moved to Boca. And that's when you see some of those earlier PBD podcast episodes. That's when he shifted from doing a lot of sit down interviews, which was what made his style particularly different. You weren't watching a podcast. It was an interview. It was a Walter Cronkite. It was a 60 minutes style show. We sat one person down. There wasn't so much discussion. It was drill. It was boom, question, boom, question, boom, question. So his style was a little different. But when they shifted to Boca, the studio, yeah, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was fine. Nothing compared to when they moved to Fort Lauderdale and built that out. I was in that studio when there was nothing in it. And they built it in, I would say, three or four days. They had the whole studio built in a bank vault. And it was so impressive. And now his production facility in Fort Lauderdale if you get the chance to go to this thing, you should. I mean, he's doing shows there. He's doing cool events. You know, the, the tickets are pretty affordable. And the, the production facility there is something that you need to see. It is so freaking cool. It's really dope. I was at the Vivek Ramaswamy event a couple months ago. I was at the Dave Rubin Giuliani event a, mm-hmm. few, a few few months ago also. It's, it's, it's really impressive. And I like, like we said in the car, I'm going to be in the VIP next time because you get yeah. the cigar lounge access. Yeah, the boardroom cigar lounge. That's so cool. It's, it's really interesting to me. I'm reading through Blue Ocean Strategy because it just kept being talked about at the, the vault event. And it yeah. was just sitting on my shelf. I just never had a chance to open it up. And so this is the thing that I'm thinking about as well. What makes me different? Because quite frankly, there's a lot of people that are trying to copy this model. Yeah. In-person recording. What's Rogan doing? And it, I think there needs to be a passion behind it. Mm-hmm. You need to be actually excited about it, passionate about it. You're not just yeah. going to throw $50 million and have a show as we, as we just discussed with, no. with Spotify's dilemma there. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking about like, what's new? What's next? Is it adding some sort of blockchain? Is it yeah. adding, you know, some sort of NFTs? I know y'all NFTs are a bad word. We're not allowed to talk about NFTs, but they're, I think they still play a part. Uh, virtual reality, is there a virtual reality? Is there augmented reality? Is, is tech the way to go? Is it the cigar lounge in the back where you get to sit with a presidential candidate? Like, what is that blue ocean strategy look like? How do you differentiate not just on the quality of the production or the quality of the guests, but on a completely different axis that hasn't been explored yet? Yeah. So really crafting an interesting narrative is important. So like you said, you said these examples of people trying to launch really big podcasts that may have been in other spaces and media or been in limelight. That doesn't necessarily mean that they have a cool story. And a lot of people in traditional media that were used to being in front of the limelight queued with cards and told what to say they don't really know how to convey themselves in an open format environment. And Joe was really, you know, Joe Rogan was the one that really started a lot of this, sitting people down and showing a different side of them when the cameras were on and you just had to have a conversation. For some people, it's, you know, not the best idea to go out and tell everything or or talk about your life, especially in those circles, because you actually don't want to. So they have to stay limited in what they can share. And that I feel like really, really relays over on the content and people feel it disingenuous and don't want to watch. I think podcasting is all about, you know, ingenuity and being genuine with people and, and Pat's both of those. He's, he's always looking to the next biggest thing and he's very, he's a very genuine person. So is Joe. So that, and, and look at Tim Dillon's podcast, for instance, in the comedy world in podcasting, it's very different. You have to be genuine. You have to, it doesn't even necessarily, if you're off with some of your comments, it's not like a PC culture in media anymore. So sometimes when you go a little bit more out there, it actually works for you. And as far as these other things like AI integration and all of that, I think as long as it helps you cultivate and establish a better community of people, you know, you, you see, you see, like we were talking the boardroom and the, the, um, the event that Pat just threw the town hall, it's all about cultivating a community that can then get invested in knowing who you are and become part of that network. So as a suggestion for you, right, the next level would be, okay, you go out there, you do the podcast, then you do a live one. That's why Sauce is live. That's why PBD Podcast is live. They do those live events every once in a while. So you can build those people in your community that follow you on Instagram and social media platforms. They get to meet you. They get to know it because it's all about, you know, being genuine they get to see if you're the real deal or not. Are you the guy that they know on camera? And this is not something that people in old media were used to. The people of the old day, you know, um, uh, George Clooney and, and Johnny Depp, they never had to have their real person examined or met, met live. Um, and everybody's searching for truth nowadays and everybody's searching for genuine people. They don't want fake anymore. 
So th those are good ideas to have, like, so people can get to know you more. You have to, it's, and you know, it's scary. You got to be able to take the risk. You got to be willing to take the risk. Yeah. I've started doing an income report every month. I'm yep. talking about how much should I make? How much should I spend? What did I learn? Where were the failures? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being open about my marriage, yeah. which, you know, but people are like, Mark, are you crazy? And cause I'll, I'll talk openly about, you know, my wife and I, we have a counselor or coach who helps us work through communication issues. And, and listen, and I said, listen, I know everybody's marriage is perfect and everyone is on cloud nine and everything works out. But I, I can tell you, I strongly encourage everyone out there, get, get someone who can play middleman in the marriage. I'm, and I don't mean middleman like, hey, can you fill in for me? And I, I'm yeah. To, <laughs> so yeah, not that. No, no, don't do that. It's a horrible idea. Don't, I know Destiny does that. Don't do that. What you need to do yeah. is, is have someone that can tell your wife when she's wrong. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, because I'm always right in the relationship. I need someone to be like, you know what, Joanna, Mark is right. You need to pay yeah. attention more. No, I, I'm, I'm half kidding there. But having someone in the middle who can help you kind of witness your weak points is really important. Um, and, 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 and again, going back to the topic here, you, I think if you want to be successful in the industry, you need to be open. You need to be willing to say stuff that other people aren't willing to say. And, you know, it's funny, my, my, my parents listen to the show sometimes and they'll be like, Mark, how are you talking about this publicly? I think it's, it's a shift. It's a complete shift in the way that we interact with our audience, the way we connect more deeply. Yeah. With our audience. You're, you're seeing the same uh, push in politics. So I, I feel that you'll find that the, I know that you'll find that the podcast shift and the media shift also will go along with the political shift that you see. And politicians nowadays that are held more accountable, that are more genuine in their message, that are less, you know, rehearsed, they've been doing pretty well. And this is on both sides. I'm not, I'm not picking a side here at all. But on both sides, if you're more genuine about your message and really care about what you think, and are more open about your family and more open about your taxes and more open about how you go day to day and you share that on a podcast platform. Look at RFK, for instance. His media push has been insane. His adoption has been insane. Vivex, the same way. Their adoption has been insane because they're showing who they are on social media platforms. So, Well, the other thing that's interesting mm -hmm. that I noticed that they're doing that other people aren't doing, like, you know, DeSantis, Biden, they're going on podcasts. Yeah. They're on podcasts everywhere. They're not going on traditional media. I mean, maybe a little bit, but they're going on podcast tours, which I think is an interesting shift. People are going to wake up to that. And, and, you know, this is, this is, this is real data that I'm about to share and I, I can't necessarily share where I got it, but the data showed through political polling, through a consulting agency that I've worked with before, that all new media about where people get their information on where to vote, even on a local level, is all done through podcasts, online, no longer, it showed the data, the actual data of 5% here, 12% here, that the shift is going from older people are still picking up the newspaper, they're still picking up, you know, turning on the TV. But as you go younger and younger, past the age of like, let's say 35 and below, from the top down, dude, I mean, everybody's getting their information from podcast and new media. And I, I think that even traditional media sources, you're going to see Fox trying to roll out, you know, podcasts with interesting people. Um, look at, look at what's happened with Tucker. Look at what happened with his metrics when he went from Fox number one show to shifting over to new media, aligning with Twitter's got some really interesting stuff coming or X, so to speak, you know, I, I gotta say, I don't love the viewing experience on X though. I like, don't, if I, I don't either. If I close the app and I get back home. It's like, Oh, it's gotta, I gotta start the video over from the beginning. I gotta figure out where I was at. I think it'll get better, but right now it's, I'm, it's not doing it. Yeah, for me. it's not doing it for me either. But I'm, I'm just saying that that shift is coming for, for even bigger media sources. The problem is, is that their creative directors are not from this world. So as a, as a creative director and producer myself, I could advise them on the steps that they need to make for their media, media choices, because they're going to come out and try to roll out a disingenuous product and they're not going to know they're not going to get any views. They, they, you can't do a Jimmy Kimmel anymore. You can't do a Jimmy Fallon anymore. And the fact that they're even still funding these shows is ridiculous. You know, they're putting out all this budget. That's, that's unbelievable to have the big show. Change the guy, change the message, make it more genuine. And you're good. I, I, think, I think that's truly it. I don't even think they're recording new episodes of Kimmel and Colbert and all that because of the writer's strike. Everyone's oh, that's on an strike. interesting point. I haven't been keeping up with that but lately. But yeah, that's, I, I, I do know about that. Um, and, and that's true. If you don't have the writers, if it's not free flow and it's not genuine and it's not off the top of the dome with the little notes, which most shows are, 
when the writers stop writing, you don't have a show anymore. But why do you even need all these writers in a room? I mean, like, I know the writers are concerned about chat GPT and these AI text writing models. Sorry, they're awesome. They're freaking, they're, they're yeah. really good. Yeah. You don't need a room full of 20 comedians anymore. Like, they, yeah. You know, and I, I, comedy's a little different. Comedy, you still need those guys like Bob Odenkirk back in the day that was writing for us. And I'll, you know, we all know him as Better Call Saul or some of the stuff he was doing during Tim and Eric era, you know, helping write their show, really cool stuff on Cartoon Network. And the guy's freaking hysterical. Bob is one of my idols when it comes to just being a very creative producer, director, and just such a funny freaking comedian. He, he's unbelievable. Um, I was actually at the Tim and Eric show live in Atlanta in 2013 when they did the live with. John C. Riley, Paul Rudd, Bob Odenkirk, and it, it was such a funny show. But you still don't. You still do need those individuals for comedy. The things that an AI are going to take a little bit more time. The more human aspects of life, the AI is going to take a little bit more time to figure that out. So I think comedy is it. But for political content or news scripted content, I mean, yeah, you could fire probably fire all the writers tomorrow, and you'll have all the best information about news. You know. It's, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. I wouldn't necessarily be surprised if that happened. And there is something that happens with comedy where you get a bunch of people in a room and they're vibing off of each other. But, you know, I don't know if, if, if all these major shows are offline now because of the writer strike. And, you know, the other problem is it's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot. Because if you're not producing content, people are going to get hungry for content and yep. they're going to go elsewhere. They're going to find these streaming platforms, yep. which, by the way, streaming has now overtaken radio in the amount of people that are listening. It's, it's finally crossed that threshold. And it's only going to go farther from here. It's just a better listening experience. Yeah. It just is. I, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell people. It's just a better listening it's experience. It's probably not too long until we have AIs having their own show. Oh, for sure. You I'm know. talking to an AI developer just mm -hmm. this week on Monday who, this is what he does. He creates AI influencers who are, they're, they're gorgeous, beautiful, 10 out of 10. Yeah. It's a big industry right now, huh? Oh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's you know, <laughs> I know the internet, you know, nobody watches yeah. porn on the internet, but AI yeah. porn is not only coming it's here. And it, so this is this is where it gets crazy. Yeah. Not only does he create these AI influencers who, again, perfect 10 out of 10 Instagram models, like, you know, uh, uncontestably beautiful. You can't tell. Oh, no, you, you can't. I mean, some of the bit. photos, yeah. you, if you look really closely, but but I think at the end of the day, it's not 20, really going to matter. 20 finger girl. Like, like no, you really don't see that. Girl, but she's got 20 fingers. And, but like, quite frankly, I don't think it's going to really matter to, to people. If they're like, okay, this gets me going, yeah. it doesn't matter if it's real or fake. I prefer 20 fingers. <laughs> Listen to this guy. Listen to this guy. That's funny. Uh, but it's, it's, it's like the biggest thirst trap in the history of humanity. Yeah. Because not only do you get to have this visual engagement with this 10 out of 10 AI model who is the perfect hair color, the perfect size, yeah. the perfect waist, the perfect breast, right? Yeah. Everything is perfect based on exactly what you want as a human being. But you can go a step further and you can actually pay a dollar per text and you can actually text back and forth with this AI influencer. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. And so what's going to happen? I've got a four-year-old son. You, you're mm -hmm. going to see the bold prediction here. Within five years, half of high schoolers are going to be dating these AI bots. Half of them. It's going to get it's going to get wild. And, yeah. You know, I don't know. Babies are going to be born in test tubes and stuff like that. But certainly young men are yeah. going to really struggle to make a connection with a, with a real life human being, with a real life woman or man, whatever you're into. Because the, the other good thing about this AI bot is it never challenges you. It tells you exactly what you want to hear. Oh, honey, you had a tough day at work. I, I got your back. I'll, I'll whisper sweet nothings into your ear. Bull crap. That's not what you need as a human yeah, being. Yeah, no, it's not. Yeah. If we saw that at the vault conference. You need to be challenged. A few months ago, I was in yeah, the- Yeah, super hard. You need to be challenged. Yep. I was in the mastermind group with, with, with Patrick, Patrick Bet David, and he gave me some tough love. He's like, Mark, you got to create the vision. You got to go for it. You got to wake up early. Stop playing around. You know what happened the next month? I signed five new clients and hired two new team members. Yeah. If I was listening to an AI said, you know what? You're trying your best. You're doing okay. I'd still be doing the same damn thing. Yeah. And I, I sat in on those calls with big entrepreneurs for a long time with the elite mastermind products that we had and the, the general mastermind products that I, you know, I brokered those services and I had clients on there. And always the best outcomes on those calls with Pat challenging people. And that's why people go to Pat because you get to a certain level and nobody can tell you to do anything. You're making 30, 40 million a year. You have your house, you have your kids, you have your wife. You know, maybe you don't have that figured out. Maybe you're struggling with all of that. And you need somebody to wake you up and tell you, hey, there was there one of the biggest uh, people in the network. Um, you know, he, he was 
kind of having issues a little bit or like mentally, like why, why is my wife with me? And Pat mm-hmm. said, it's because you deliver. Cause you deliver, you, you, you have the company, you have, you make all the revenue, you show up and you deliver for your wife and kids. And, and those moments of challenge are what really push people. So to your point, having dating a girl, an AI girl, first of all, I'm not interested. One of the funny things is the more, (laughs) this is a funny thing that somebody told me a while back in a, in a conversation about this, the more that people like AI women, also the more women are available, like actual women, right? So it, it's a win for the people who are engaged to, to like the right things and actually like physical connection. And and I think that's where society is really going. As things get really automated and fake and social media continues to just pull people into the psychotic nature of not knowing what's real, which we're, we can talk about too, there's going to be a certain percentage of people that say, I'm I'm done with this. I'm back to the human things. I want to have a nice date. I want to have a nice dinner. I want to have a good conversation with a girl. That's what I, I love conversation, dude. That's my biggest thing is conversation. So I think it's an interesting point that you made, Don, that if all, if half of humanity, half of these guys out there are dating AI bots, that's more women for the rest. Go for it, dude. Right. Like, like, like go for it. But here's the problem. (laughs) Here's the problem. If you're dating an AI bot, you're not going to be in a good headspace. You're going to be in a really bad headspace. You're Mm -hmm. not going to be challenged. You're not going to be achieving. I go back, you know, 20 years ago, I was smoking a lot of weed. I was playing a lot of video games. I was not in a good headspace. I was not being challenged. I used to be a gamer too. I mean, just every yeah. night, it's the same damn thing. I wait, yeah. I, I don't even go to sleep till the, the sun comes up because I'm killing boars in World of Warcraft, winning these little, you know, and here's another gold piece. It's like, it's that dopamine burst. It's fake dopamine. It's like mental heroin. Yeah. And if these kids are just obsessed with AI, in dating this bot, they're getting dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. But, but the real dopamine comes when you struggle and you suffer and, yeah. you, and you do tough things. Mm-hmm. This was the be- I'm, I just turned 40. This is the best year of my life. Yeah. Got to leave my job, got to help clients, meeting people, networking. I got James Altucher on the show um, a few weeks ago. Yeah. I had uh, uh, uh You're blanking a little bit, but this is natural, you know, I, shows you're not an AI. Now I'm good. Yeah. Now I'm good. You're not a robot. I've, I've got, <laughs> I've got, I had Neil Patel on the show. Yeah. I've got Dave Rubin coming up. I'm sitting here with Don Cappy. Like, yeah. you, you know, something happens when you struggle and it was not, it, it's been a long curve to get here, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, 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 to me, that's where the gains come from. Yeah. And just, just trying to, just kind of finish this thought. If you have all these kids that are in a bad headspace, all these young men in bad headspace, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to turn to violence. Mm -hmm. They're going to turn to, uh, you know, questioning what is going on inside of them. And it leads to not just impact on their lives, but the lives of people around them, like, you know, you and me. You know, it's it's not only a a thing to point at kids with. It's not only a thing to say what's going to happen to the kids, right? It's actually a situation where grown-ups and fathers and mothers have to take responsibility for their overusage of Instagram and their overusage of the social media platforms that they are accustomed to and really sit down with their kid and say, hey, listen, you know, you can't be on TikTok all day. You can't, you, you can't date the AI girl. Like it's almost like finding out that you find out your son's dating an AI girl. You say, dude, like, listen, what are you doing, man? Like, she's not real. I know you like her, but what are we talking about here, man? You just don't get it, dad. But yeah, you just don't get, okay, well, um, something's going on. Like, we're going to have to go on a retreat. We're going to just get, we're just going to have to move. You know, I I think, I also think that there there are areas in the world that when you have this 5G development and you have all this automation, there are other places in the world that are less developed. And you're going to see a mass exodus of people who can't take the Blade Runner 42, Blade Runner 4048 world. And they're going to go to places like South America. I've spent a little bit of time going back and forth to Medellin because the food is real. The the people are real. The environment is real. And it just gives you a different sense of life. It's less automated. You don't feel 5G. You don't, you, you don't have the same conversations about politics or the 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 nonsense that goes on in the world you don't have a single political conversation when you're in Medellin 
literally all you're talking about is, wow, that food was so great. That time together was so great. Didn't you enjoy that beautiful sunset? Part of the reason that I go back and forth there, but it's, it's a little bit too slow for me. That's why, that's why I'm going to stop going for a while. It's just too slow. There, there's not enough going on. And that's what comes with the bigger, you know, that's what comes with New York. Like, why would you live in New York City? Well, all the money's there at one point. All the media is there. And that's, that's the same thing that's going to happen with Miami. That's why everybody's moving down here. The real estate is crazy because all the media, all the money is, is pretty much in Miami right now, shifting down from New York and, and LA, draining out. I don't know if you saw this, day. but... The the MLS Messi just got exclusive Crazy. rights with uh with, was Apple TV Crazy. It's a streaming platform by the way yeah platform. so you've got you've got that happening you've got what's happening with Value Payment Patrick and David you've yeah. got Fresh and Fit down here yeah uh, Ben Shapiro's down here Ruben's down here too I'm pretty Dave sure Dave Ruben's down yeah. here moved from LA mm-hmm. so all the independent media is starting to circle here and again this is kind of and we could talk about my media business plan at, at some point but yeah what 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 I think we're going to start to see is people are going to you're going to fly in to go to a conference you're going to fly in to speak on say the value team with Patrick Bet David and you you're, you're going to want to stop in my studio you're going to want to stop in Ruben's studio you're going to stop want to stop at all these independent media studios I do also wonder, because Florida has turned much more conservative. Yes. You know, it went almost, I mean, DeSantis crushed it in the last election. In California, obviously very, very blue. Yes. Right. So I wonder if we're going to see a dynamic where if you want to talk blue and all the, like Bill Maher, Mm -hmm. you know, all the, all the, the liberal speaking points, well, you got to go to Cali for that. And if you want to speak to the conservative and the, and the, the, the independent type speakers are going to be in South Florida. I wonder if we're going to see a you, sort like that. You probably will see that, you know, depending on what happens with different things, because you had a major influx with how DeSantis handled things during the not to be mentioned period of time that lasted for about two years, right? That that he, you know, had the policies that allowed different things to happen in a different way. And, and people came down here because they were really just trying to escape. And, um, it led to a very interesting environment. It led to a lot of money. It led to a lot of confusion as well. I mean, I, I went to the the Bitcoin event 2021 and it was an amazing event with all these amazing people. But at the same time, people were confused with what Miami was at that time. They were showing up and they were saying, wow, Miami's so cool. I've seen Miami through, I grew up here. I grew up in Boca Raton, Florida, right? And, and so South Florida seeing the environment change. You went to Miami, 2016, 2017, pretty much all it was was a party scene with the best clubs in the world and the best house music, which I, I'm a huge house music guy. I, I sing I sing some house music. I've got some big connections in the industry. It was all music. And then all of a sudden, like that, you have Bitcoin convention, you have Vault, you have Grand Cardone. NFT Miami. NFT Miami. And, and all these people in Miami going, wow, I love this. This is amazing. You had rents go from let's say the same place for 1,213. There was a place in Miami that I was looking at renting when I, when I had no money for like 900 bucks a month, right? In this, in this building. And I, I, it was during the summer and in the summer of Miami, the rents went down, you know, it used to go down. And that was 2019. After what happened, that same place, 900 is probably 1,700, 1,800 minimum. Yeah. Like you can't even, you cannot find a place for 900 bucks a month. In Miami. My home is tripled in value. We bought it at 165. We probably sell it for 410 420 yeah that's amazing yeah yeah it's it's wild but there's you know there's a lot of expenses but I, the other thing i think that makes florida south florida again we're bringing this back to south florida being the new hub for independent media and business media. you don't have you don't have a state income tax as a business mm-hmm. you know so if, if you're creating all this media experience like the taxes i pay like i i talk to my friends who are in cali they're i'm telling them what i'm paying in taxes they're telling me what and it's not even close it's it's not even close so if you're growing a business, the taxes are, are a killer, especially for a small business. You know, if you're a huge business, it's easier to, to eat that bullet. But, in, you know, if you're an up and coming business owner, it's freaking hard. 90% of businesses fail. Yeah. 90% of small businesses fail. And taking off that tax burden is, is a big freaking deal. And especially if you're, I hate to use the term riding the coattails, but if all the big media companies are going to be down here, it makes it, you, it, makes it more accessible for, for doing this in-person thing. Mm-hmm. I've, you know, the vast majority of the recordings I've done for the show have been remote. You yeah. know, I use Riverside FM. That's my go-to. But I, I, I definitely wanted to start doing more, more of this 
in-person stuff. But I will, I want to get your opinion on this, Don. Yeah. A lot of big creators are doing the in-person stuff now. I see Travis Chappell doing it. He's the founder of Guestio. Um, a friend of mine, Jeremy Slate, doing in-person. And these are not huge, huge podcasts, but they're they're starting to get on this trend. So I'm wondering, you know, is the in-person recording too late? Are we too late with this? Is there, does there need to be something else to differentiate it? That blue ocean type of strategy to make it different and to really stand out mm. in this, as this market becomes more more crowded. I think the thing to make it stand out is have a have a head start on the media infrastructure. So I was I was going to bring that up uh, about a minute ago. I was thinking in my head about media infrastructure being that the only reason why LA and New York still exist as media operations in some of the other big cities is they have the studios and they have the equipment and they have everything you need to make a major motion picture. Yeah. You're not making a major motion picture in studios down in South Florida yet. You have Orlando, kind of. I don't know what they've filmed out of the Orlando location for movies. I mean, we'd probably be surprised what they've filmed. But if you go to L.A. and you go to New York, you know, you have the big headquarters where they can film the bigger shows that do metrically really, really well. So you're going to see a shift to more and more studios, more and more excitement, more and more infrastructure to Miami. Once Miami makes that shift infrastructurally, that's when you'll see it take over the media landscape. I could also, you know, you don't need those big studios anymore. You just don't need them. And, and you're going to see this blow up yeah. is AI generated content, mm -hmm. AI generated video, all those big explosions, the pyrotechnics, the director, the huge staff. Yeah. You're not going to need that anymore because a 12 year old, 15 year old Malaysian kid mm -hmm. is going to be able to create some of the most amazing images and video possible. I just recorded a video on this the other day for my YouTube channel. You can, Logos are hard. By the way, 95% of logos just straight up suck. They're it's terrible. They just suck. I'm sorry. The, your logo is probably not very good. Yeah. So I popped open this program. It's called ideogram.ai. Ideogram.ai. Yeah. It's free. And you just type in what you want. I could say logo of, it will take value tainment logo. Yeah. Lion with a shield. Fierce. It'll create sick, nasty logos in seconds, dude. Yeah. It is bananas. Mm-hmm. I was, I was seeing this video of this beer commercial that's fully AI generated. It looked weird as hell because there's people with the 20 fingers and stuff. <laughs> weird. Yeah. Kind of creepy. Yeah. But it's, it's going to get better mm -hmm. really fast. And so you're not going to need that whole video production studio like has historically happened. You're going to be able to create like sick, nasty movies in the middle of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. You know, although, I, again, I think South Florida is going to be the place, place to be for the tech. Um, sh it should be here. Yeah. It's still, you're going to need tech. You're going to need those, those editors. You're going to need those technicians that know how to get that done. Um, and, and on, on top of that, I will say that I prefer my favorite era of cinema is from 19, late 1970s to early two thousands. If I pick a film I'm watching in, in that, in that realm, why I, I love the thing. I love it. I love all of those, all of those uh, psychological thrillers because they brought the real to, you know, the thing is one of the greatest animatronic or practical effects films that's ever been done in horror. And I think that's why it keeps its place. Predator, the same thing. I mean, amazing practical effects that were done in that film. I think that the eye still is able to see that it's fake when you, when you watch it. And I think that that practical effect nature and the organic nature of human storytelling that happened when you had people like Stanley Kubrick making films, you know, a big director that really knows the vision and knows how to narrate versus the AI automation putting something together. I think there's an incompatibility with the human brain and AI for now. But there, is this nostalgia talking? No, it's not nostalgia. I think it's just visual, like visually, your brain can tell that the scene with Thanos and all the guys flying behind him is, is fake for now. You know, th there are things basically in physics that the AI probably just can't figure out exactly how something would move in space time. If it's generating an image, they, these are just some of the cinematography or cinema ideas I have that might not be compatible for now, but. I'm always hesitant. To, I, I, you, like, I get you. I get what you're saying. I'm trying to Don. push back a little bit on, on, on AI I, I and always, cinema. I always feel like. The, the older generation, I'm a millennial, it yeah. looks back to the young generation, you know, these damn kids, they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They, you know, kids get off my lawn. Back in my day, I, I, I'm very hesitant to say, although some of the stuff that's happening is yeah. so 
freaking weird. There's um there's this new trend on TikTok mm-hmm. where these these girls, these influencers are pretending to be NPCs. I've seen that. I was going to bring that up. I saw that the other day. My friends went live on their, this platform called Whatnot, where you like sell like purses and stuff like that. Um, there, there were, I, there was a, a girl and her, and her mom that I was chilling with and, and shooting some content for them. And they went on this live and their friend, who's another creator in that space, who does about a hundred thousand dollars a month on, on Whatnot, selling these purses. She's just like wearing the best jewelry, looks great, great outfit. She's doing this, right? And she, we're in the car and she starts bringing up this NPC thing that she's doing on her trend. And she's like, hello, hello, like doing this like NPC thing. Yeah, it, freaked, a, it freaked me out. Yeah, freaked so me out. just to kind of explain, if you haven't, if you haven't seen this, it, it basically the creator is encouraging you to use emojis. Mm-hmm. And if someone uses emoji for like a watermelon, it'll do something like chomp, chomp, chomp. So good, so good. And then they'll, They'll do something like, okay, ice cream. Oh, thank you so much. So good. It's so freaking weird. It's so weird. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to start to see people doing this type of stuff in real life, having yeah. real kind of conversations like, oh, thank you so much. It's, 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 so, it's so strange, man. I, I feel like technology, AI, smartphones is like the largest test on humanity uh-huh. it, it, at scale. When we, we're already seeing the effects. Yeah. Obviously, suicides are up, depression's up, all kinds of, of crazy stuff. The other thing that I think is interesting, we look at new media, the older generations are consuming more of the long form content. The younger generations are consuming more of the short form content. You know, so I wonder if attention spans are starting to be impacted. Yeah, 100%. The, the attention, the biggest thing that will affect your attention span is the endless scroll. Once they figured that out, that, mm. The infinite scroll mechanism where you could watch a reel, watch a reel, watch a reel, watch a reel. And this will greatly affect your ability to focus on any sort of topic to get better. One of the things that really changed my life in the past two months is I started listening to Dr. Joe Dispenza on a podcast with um, Ed Milet. And I, I'm incredibly grateful for this man. Both of them, Ed, Ed, Ed Milet's content has changed my life many times over. Max out great content because working for Pat, I was in the personal development world at the highest level. But Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about all of these things that we need to wake up in the morning, not hop on the phone, let, yeah. your, let your brain lower in its frequency, not get caught up in fear and reactionary mindsets and, and allow yourself to focus on things so you can have a day without what other people are saying. And if everybody kind of follows this model, I think we'll have a healthier place. But the endless scroll he talks about, that's very dangerous for your brain because it's dopamine, dopamine, shift, shift. What happens is when you're doing that endless scroll, you have, let's say you have one topic and you have another topic. Then you have a guy jumping off a a cliff on a motorcycle. And then you have a video of Tom Cruise and you have a video. All of these different things that you're thinking about when you watch this, they activate your brain and light up different neural pathways. So it starts off a neural storm that Mm. really affects you for the rest of the day. And all of a sudden your brain starts thinking like this, oh, that, 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 that. And then you carry on your day by going, I need to get that email. What about that? Okay. And, and sometimes this can completely paralyze your progress for the rest of the day, especially if you, you have a creative project. I've had to follow this motto because if I have to focus on some creative projects that I'm working on, like Alan, Alan did the turnaround for the, the Brady interview 24 hours, did the turnaround for the highlight reel for the vault 2023, 20, 24 hours. You can't sit there for 12 hours if your mind is boggling on social media all day. And, and I, look, I get that, but it's really hard. I mean, yeah. I'm on Instagram, I'm on LinkedIn, yeah. I'm on YouTube, I'm on all these different platforms. I'm getting emails. I've got Slack notifications. I do all my CRM through Monday, go high level. I'm in all these places at once, but text. Um, but I, I need to be there, which by the way, this is one of the real reasons why I think anyone who's in the creative field, every business owner needs to have somebody that's managing all this stuff. Yes. Because I can turn it off. I know that my girl, Samantha, what's up, Samantha? Samantha is going to be posting my content every day. She's going to be making sure that it's optimized. She's going to be tagging people because it's so overwhelming to do that. I also, this is a reason why I have checklists. You, you need to have a checklist. Um, because there's going to be a point inevitably during the day where like, I don't know what to do. What do I do next? Okay, I'm just going to keep working down my checklist. You know, it's kind of funny at uh, the Valuetainment Vault Conference, it was talking about what motivates you. And one of the categories was procedural, I think. I can't remember the exact name, but part of that was checklist. And 
checklists don't motivate me, right? But they, but they are a guide. Yeah, they keep you organized. They are a guide. What, what, what motivates me is freedom. Uh, the freedom to make my own decisions, the, the lifestyle that comes along with that, and reputation. Reputation as well is, is a big component of the, the lifestyle motivator. Uh, we were at the Vault Conference. I was having a conversation with someone, and this guy walks up, butts in the conversation, goes, Mark, I love your show. Never met this. I never met him before. Mark, I love your show. Thank you. It's so great. I'm going to be, you've got a listener for life. What's up, brother? I'm so glad that you're listening. And that was, that fires me up. Yeah. That makes me want to keep going mm -hmm. and keep doubling down and spending the money and investing in the studio and investing in the guests and investing in the hardware and the software and the systems just, just to blow it out. Yeah. You know, it, it, it really motivates me, which is, uh, which is because my main, my main, so let's, let's talk a little bit of business strategy. I want to talk about media business plan. Okay. If, if, if we yeah, could, because I want, I want you to down. tear it, I want you to tear it apart here because. Yeah. That's what I'm doing on the next right now. The, the application, uh, the next I've been doing, uh, media consulting strategy. So people just book you right on the app. It's something that Pat rolled out a little while ago and they just click on your link and 15, 20, 30 minutes. You can talk about media strategy. I've had four or five consultations this week after, after the vault. So it's been good. It's been cool. Dig it. But yeah, let's, let's, let's dive in, bro. Let's yeah. Dive in. So part of, part of putting together. Part of why this, the, the Bullet Conference was really important to me mm -hmm. was it gave me the clarity as to where I'm go, where I want to go. Because my main income stream right now is podcast post-production. Yes. Client records a podcast, fills out a five-minute form. My team does the rest, the copywriting, the editing, the show notes, the graphics, the clips, the posting, the YouTube, the optimization. We do all of that on the back end. Yeah. Make people's lives really easy. That's the main breadwinner. That's not what wakes me up. Mm. What makes me up in the morning is what we're doing right now. So how do I do more of that? So being clear on where I want to go, then I can kind of backtrack it to look at my, my next steps. And kind of like I mentioned, I mentioned this a couple of times, I want to have the premier location in South Florida. If someone's in town, they say, I got to go record with Mark. Yeah. You know, I've got PR agencies. I've got booking agents. They, they'll reach out to me. We can, we can schedule that. So some of the steps here, more in-person recording, connect with local studios, Arrange recording times. Yes. Makes sense. Makes sense. Right. Even maybe even investing in more equipment for my house too. That's something I'm thinking about. Also optimally having stuff that's close to the airport. Yes. Right. What do you think? How important do you think is I'm kind of, I'm going down this kind of slowly here, but how important do you think it is to pay guests to come on your show? Mm. You know, some of these guests are really freaking expensive. You know, you could pay 40 grand, 20 grand to bring someone on your show. How important do you think it is to actually be paying guests? And how important do you think it is to have guests paying you? We're, we're talking a little bit about the money side here because, you know, without the money, you're not living your dream. You need to generate cash. Yeah. I think identifying truly narrative blue ocean strategies in the people that are coming on, maybe they don't have to be big names yet. Obviously, the bigger names that you get on, this is some Hormozy stuff right now, the bigger names that you get on, you're tapping into their network when you have them on and vice versa. So you're, you're gathering their leads, you're gathering their followers, and you're adding them onto your, your, current, your current people that watch your show. The, the better people to get on are the ones with the, bigger, the biggest markets you can get with the most coherent narratives. So somebody who agrees with the sentimentality of your show and the AI and, and the topics that you cover, like we had a conversation, we related with that, right? Um, but finding the biggest people that you can with the coherent narrative, you have more adoption, you have more crossover, and then you have more retainment of those, of those people, right? How important is it to be doing that in person? I th dude, I think it's very important because it's, it's all about networking. I, I think that's the main reason why Pat even has Valuetainment Network is so he could network with all those people and, and bring them on, have the interview, but then also take them out to dinner and see who they are and have them on his phone. And, and if you don't have that in person, you don't have that connectivity, you don't have that network, Striking business deals with them. There's always business opportunities that come out of meeting a, a person with a big media presence. I think the best way to get media people besides having a, a paid booker that makes the calls, that tries to bring them on, that hounds them with the emails, that it would be best somebody else doing that for you. So it's, you're not having to edify yourself. You're not having to beg. It's somebody saying, hey, we really want to get you on the show. We really want to get you on After Hours Entrepreneur. We think that you would be a great fit for the show. What can we work out here? Trying to renegotiate those deals. Renegotiate what it would be if they're 50 grand. Give the person a call. Have somebody call for you. Maybe it gets down to 10. 
The other way is I would go and network in those circles of people that have the events. I would show up, meet them in person, much less likely to ask you for a payment if you go up to them and say, hey, I have, they're going to ask you how many viewers, how many followers do you have? This is the procedure for booking on the SauceCast. It's like, do you have 25,000 followers on YouTube? Yes, let's talk. No, sorry, right? So meeting people in person is going gonna, is gonna to be a big thing for, for you and the growth of, of your company and the podcast and focusing on people with an actual message, you know, that that's something genuine, something different, maybe attacking a new niche. The, the biggest thing that Pat did, I, I would call it micro niching. And this is just something that I saw over the growth of being there. And, and it's almost my, my own term that I developed. Micro niching is taking mafia, taking bodybuilding, taking politics, taking all these things, doing it really well, giving a big person the space. And then when I was making calls for VTI, I used to do cold calls for, for Pat. Hey, welcome to, hey, thanks for calling. Uh, or, you know, hey, is this Dan? Oh, Dan, great. Uh, this is Dom from Valuetainment. How are you doing today? Yeah, working on some new things with the media channel. Just wanted to share it with you. We also have the vault conference coming up. Are you open to a call? Yeah, Pat's doing this, 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 and this. Um, what was your favorite episode? And most of the time they would go, Oh my God, uh, this could be a mafia boss. This could be like, it could, it could have been anybody in the phone. Wall Street traders I talked to, celebrities I talked to. They'd be like, oh, I loved it when uh, Pat did the uh, mafia interview with uh, Sammy the Bull. Oh my God, I, I love that big Wall Street trader. So you're calling big names. You're not just going through the phone book. You're calling no, actual yeah, names, yeah, yeah, yeah players. And, yeah, and, and, and they would, you know, they would, be, they would be the subliminal players. They wouldn't be people like, out in front, you know, we, we get the number, we call, email, we come, we come in, you know, they fill out a form, we get a number, we make the call. But what I'm trying to say is people would like Pat for many, many different reasons. They wouldn't like him so much for the insurance side of things. Like that would not be, because he never talked about it. But that right? gives him a lot of credibility. Yes. No, in, it, in it does. That's the, that's the behind credibility. Like Hormozzi talks about, do something very big and then talk about it probably don't roll out your show until you've actually done something, right? But on the micro niching side, he captivated all of these audiences with different types of content and brought them all into a message that they agreed upon that were kind of the set principles and values behind the message of valuetainment. But we would get people that love mafia, bodybuilding, sports, like whatever it may be. So that way he captured all the markets, not just talking about insurance, not just talking about sales. Like Grant Cardone caught the sales and real estate market. That's about it. Did some other interviews, but that's about it. But I think what's important also is that you can actually talk in an educated fashion on those topics yeah. too, right? <laughs> I was talking to Pat about that in his general mastermind as well. You know, micro niche down to a few niches. Doesn't just need to be one niche, mm -hmm. but start to show your interest in different niches. Get educated. How deep can you go on that topic and then be loud, be noisy? Specifically, finding things that is, 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 mainly perceived as being true that you don't believe is true. The whole industry thinks one thing, you're going in another direction yeah. and being mm -hmm. noisy about it. I think that's a little bit of the blue, blue ocean strategy there. I also like the idea of calling players. I also, I'm still going to be doing remote recordings because some people, it's hard to get in the same room with them. But I did a lot of remote recordings until he grew to the point where nobody's going to say no to showing up. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the ability for value team to make calls and bring people in, the ability for us to get people to come to the event when we were a 20 person company in Boca, maybe 20, 25, and we were sitting around 2.6, 2.7 million, I was there right when it crossed three, right when he went on the first Joe Rogan interview. Now it's a 4.7. It's almost doubled in size, if not truly doubled. And now his pull power is just much bigger. But also when he gets the better studio and you show people a better time and you take them out to a better dinner, these are all strategies that he used to get the big players on, on board. But then he also leveraged the ability to have the PHP event, which is a big budget event that he throws every year in Vegas with all of his PHP people. Very cool event. Um, that's the one where he'll, he'll throw fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars at a guest because he has it built into the budget of the big event, right? Yeah. Early Vault Conference, we didn't really have you know super big guests. We had Dustin Poirier because I was like in a meeting. I was like, Pat, we should have Dustin Poirier. He just he's gonna be up and fight, you know. Uh, he, he, he just beat, uh, Connor. Oh my gosh, this is great. So he brought Dustin, which was a cool interview, but as time goes on and his media presence gets bigger, that's when you should expect bringing the bigger people on, but doing it in studio is a big pull. If you can catch them when, when you make the calls, when you try to get the big people, the biggest thing is logistics. That's the biggest thing. Right. Are they in town? Is there a convention? 
Look at the big conventions that are in town and call everybody. Try to get somebody else to call for you, not you. Somebody else to make the calls for you to edify you. Tell them, shoot them over the press kit. Shoot, shoot them over the one page. Hey, we saw Michael Saylor's in town. Does he want to come on? Yeah, he's two hours away. Sure, he's got like a three-hour gap. Versus, hey, uh, Michael Saylor, random day. Hey, Michael Saylor, do you want to come on? Dude, I'm in, I'm in the UK. I can't fly all the way to come see you in Boca or, or see you in South Florida. Like, shut up. I'm like, we're never talking again. Catch them when they're in town. Yeah. So that's the biggest thing. Well, how are you getting the phone numbers in the first place? Is it your network it, it, and just leveraging your network or your buying lists? How are we getting the numbers? Oh, no, man. Connections? I mean, that's, that's like, you got to get somebody really, really savvy with finding people's numbers. Yeah. You got to get somebody who's really, really good at finding people's numbers. That's just straight up. Well, and I do, emails. I, I do think that I'm somewhat advantaged here because I've been doing this a hot minute. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Five years, probably 500 interviews. My Rolodex is, is pretty big at this point. Yeah. And, and leveraging one guest to get another guest to get another guest is, is, is a big freaking deal. I had Eric Sue on the podcast and I said, hey, you know, can you connect me with Neil Patel? He's, you know, mega, mega, mega big. He's like one of the biggest SEO experts in the world. He's like, you know, you can get in touch with him, just send him an email, send him an email, had him on the show the following week. Yeah. People are open to new media, man. They know it's going to be, and you don't know who the big players are yet. You, you can't, you can't identify who the big players are yet. There's only, there's only like probably five or six big players. Yeah. And, and especially in the podcast space, I've had clients that I worked with at VT. My biggest client that I had at VT was Andy Elliott. Andy Elliott is a massive, um, he, first of all, I'll talk about who he is as a person. Andy and Jackie are two of the most genuine people you ever meet in your entire life. They're sweethearts. They've done so much for me in my life. They care about you so much. I'll let you stay at their house if you go, like, if, if they're tight with you. They, they're doesn't the sweetest he, people. Doesn't he require you to have a six-pack to talk with yeah, him? Yeah, even, even just to walk <laughs> up to him and talk. No, he'll poke you. He'll be like, dude, you need to lose some weight, man. But it's good. It's good. I, I think at one point, this is a funny story. I think at one point he looked at me and he said, dude, it was on the phone when he closed me <laughs> to come to, I called him to close them to come to our event and I pick up the phone and it's him and he closes me to come to his event. He's like, <laughs> I'd already closed him for, you know, to come to our event. So it was, I was like, okay, you got me, whatever. He's we get pretty the good. Phone, he's we get good. the phone. He's like, hey man, what do you, I, I called Danny, Danny Klein, shout out to Danny Klein, one of my closest friends, really cool dude. He's, he's on Andy's team. He's like my rep over there. Dan, Danny and I go way back. <laughs> and I called Danny. He's like, yeah, hold on one second. He passes it over to Andy and he's like, yo, what's up, big dog? What are you doing? Are you coming out to the event? Come on, man. He's like, <laughs> how old are you? And I'm like, 28. He's like, man, tell me this. This is what it told me. Tell me this, man. How do I look better than you at 40 plus and you're 28 and you don't even look good? And I'm like, crap, dude. Okay. And he's Shut like, yeah. Her. And you came to the vault. What happened after you came to my training the, the month before the vault? You tripled your numbers. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, don't you want to do that again? And I'm like, because after I went out there, dude, I was fired up. I came back in the office of Valuetainment and people were like, what the, what the heck is wrong with this guy? I was like, let's go. Let's freaking go. Like, what are you doing? You're making calls. Like, I was going nuts on people. That's what Andy does. You go out to his events and he, amp he just boosts you up. But it was funny. He closes me, whatever. Just talking about Andy and Jackie as individuals. They're out in Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona. They, they at the time, two years ago, had about 30,000 followers. They had done a lot of sales. They had a lot of people in their community. They built community first. They built a Facebook community. They built an environment first. They monetized before they grew as social media. So they're, they're reverse. Valuetainment grew in social media and now is starting to monetize. They monetized day one with the way that they did their marketing and the people that they brought in and the serviceable product that they had, which was learn how to do sales. Every auto guy knows who Andy is. I went to buy a car last year and, and the guy sitting there was like, Hey, what's up? I'm like, I'm gonna pull, I'm gonna pull out my card. I was sent my buddy Lewis. I was like, Lewis, Lewis, watch this. Hey, man, um, I'm buddies with Andy Elliott. Do you know how that is? He's like, what? What, well, dude? Why are your buddies with Andy Elliott? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. You want me to call him right now? And I got him on the phone. He's like, what's up, big dog? He's like, no, Andy, uh, what's up, man? How you doing? He's like, make sure you take care of my buddy Don and get him a good deal on the car. I'm like, thank you, Andy. Appreciate it. <laughs> Drop like six grand off the friggin' check because he's so big in the uh, the auto space. But he monetized first. And they were trying to figure out the different things that were going to grow his social media presence. They, they, they were doing a podcast. They have a podcast. But the best model that worked for him was Facebook strategy, getting all of his reps onto Facebook, making them build a community, 
the second you add Andy Elliott on Facebook, your Facebook now becomes a Facebook ad for Andy Elliott services. It's mm. unbelievable. There's thousands and thousands of people in the network that if they know, if they see a picture with you and Andy, all of a sudden they all add you. You get like 100 followers a day when I was at BT because Andy called me out at one of his events. He's just a great guy. I like that. But they went down that model, monetized first, and then started growing their social media. In two years, he went from 30K followers on Instagram to 600 plus followers on Instagram. And they're monetizing heavy because they have a product, they have merch, they have a good team, and they're able to service the product on the back end. Yeah, that's the other thing with Pat. If you push out all this content, there's a lot of click funnel people out there, been around them, some of them have been my client. They try to sell you on a thing, $100,000 package. They're making $100,000. They're flipping one guy on a $100,000 package per month who's dumb enough to buy the service, okay? They're just the right guy, just the right fit, just a little timid enough, doesn't really know who you are enough, believes people too quickly, and sell them $100,000. That's not what Andy's doing. That's not what Pat's doing. That's not what Homozy's doing. These guys know how to do it. But there's a lot of people out there that do it the wrong way. They, they have a package, but they, fulfillment is the most important thing. I do, I do think that, you know, we talk about the media, media industry and, the, and specifically this media business, but I think it is important to me that I have something to offer, some sort of, because the income that you get off sponsorships and, you know, I have guests that pay to be on the show, it's, it, it's, it's hard to make a living off that, obscenely hard to make a living off that. My goal, at least in, in the next few steps, is generate enough income that it supports the production of the show itself. You know, mm -hmm. the post-production, you know, upgrades to equipment, studio space. With, with podcasts, with scaling a podcast, like you're talking about this business model, if you want to scale the podcast out appropriately, I can, I can walk you through each step of who was brought on in sequence to VT. First person brought on, filmer. First person brought on. Videographer, right? Literally, the story is he handed the camera, he handed the camera to his, his close confidant at the time, said film. Number two was sales to push some of the things and make the calls, make the cold calls to get other people on, just a general sales, general management sort of position, making the calls. To get the guests to come yes, on the show. Yes, to do everything, to sell the products, to, you know, if he had t-shirts, sell the t-shirts, whatever it may be. That was number two. I know both these guys very well. They're, they're outstanding men. Great, great men. Uh, Mario and Kai, great guys. Then Kai shifts over and he starts, he becomes the Jamie. So then you need a Jamie. You need a guy that can make the show better by putting up things on the screen, making it look cool, more innovative topics, helps you write a little bit, helps you come up with topics. You have a, now have a council of people to work with and talk. And maybe that can, maybe I can be that for you. Maybe we, you know, carry this on and I, I help, you know, in the future. But then the, the other scalability is, after that position, I'm trying to think what, what would be the, the next best thing. You know, production assistance would be another one. I think then it was really the editors and the production team to get the content out faster to multiple platforms and focus on getting up to three to six to seven threshold of posts a day, right? Yeah. So you got the strategy, you have the filmer. Now you're starting to build a circle of people that consult with you on your product that tell you what you're talking about is appealing, that tell you that what you're talking about people are going to adopt. Now you're building a network. And then from there, it's all back admin. Like you start scaling the, the corporate setting. It was really those core three, maybe four or five guys for a long time, for about a year, maybe two years for VT. Just yeah, but, core people. I mean, check it out. You're talking about hiring one, two, three, four, five, maybe six. It's crazy expensive your to believers, hire people like that. Your believers need to be the first people. Your people that truly believe in you, number one, they love you. They love your network. You have these people in your network. They're probably hitting you up saying, dude, I freaking love your show. I would love to talk to you. Like those are the people that you, you, you get them out. You say, listen, put you up here. I'll, I'll make sure that you're, you're okay. You're going to get paid this. And then down the road, we're going to talk about when it grows inevitably, when all the merch starts coming in, you'll have a seat at the table. I'll kind make like interns in a, yeah, in a, in interns a way. In a way. Yeah. People, Super fans are the people that will come to you first that you can really start to bring on for a lower amount, but you paint the big picture for them long term and you show them the vision of what the show is going to be. What about public speaking? I'm starting to put a big emphasis on pub public speaking. Great. I've got public speaking at four or five colleges, yes, a few events, conferences. Obviously, that, that's, that's a big one, driving, driving attention. Podcast, also making relationships with podcast booking agencies, PR agencies, I get so many requests to be on the show. You know, this is, a, this is kind of a pet peeve of mine. Yeah. Is 
people that don't appreciate the opportunity to be on a show. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. people, they feel like they're doing you a favor to come on your show and get introduced to your network and to have tons of clips created, to all the editing. Years, I don't think people understand how many years of labor, I mean, tens of thousands of hours of labor to get to where I'm at today. And I feel like I'm not even nearly where I want to be. Like, if I look at a clip or a video that I made a year ago, I'm like, damn, I sucked. Yeah, I sucked. Like, I'm so much better now. And I'm sure the same thing's going to happen next year. and be like, damn, that interview with Don, that was crap. Yeah. I was yeah. so terrible. I, yeah, like, we, we think it's amazing now, but then you look back and it's same, same with me. You know, I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I said this and that. With, with, the, with the group that you're talking about, the people that are just ungrateful, they're probably just ungrateful in the rest of their life too. Throw them on a Joe Dispenza. Send them the Joe Dispenza Ed Milet interview and see what they have to say after that. I mean, they, they just need kind of a, a change and, and, and rework about how they're thinking because, or they're just uneducated about what media can do for them. Are you talking more about bigger people that are ungrateful? Because no, no, no. that happens a lot. But just people that you're like trying to work with and they're like, oh, I guess I'll come on, like whatever. Yeah, or people be like, hey, Mark, I'm, let me come on your show. Let me come on your show. I want to come on your I'm like, what do you want to talk about? Uh, I want to promote my product or something. And they don't know, dude. Or they're, they or they're not even interested in, or, like, or they'll show up on a potato, right? They show up on screen. They, have, they, have, they don't have a mic. They, their audio is terrible. It's, it's like, I, it almost feels insulting yeah. to me in a way. I, I mean, because you said, they, they don't know. And I, I, don't hold it, I don't hold it against that person. But in this day and age, if you don't have a $60 microphone that plugs straight into your laptop, what are you doing? Yeah. You, you should not be reaching out to podcasts to guests if you don't have a $70 microphone, period. Yeah. You should not be doing it. You, yeah. Not only is it insulting to the host who's spending all this time to put on a great show, but you look stupid in front of the audience. I'm sorry. Tough love here. You look stupid in front of the audience when no, you, you sound you, bad. You do. You do. And, and the other, I, I think the underlying part of this is I always focused when I was growing up on being this vision of my parents were very encouraging of the creative arts. Very, very encouraging. So I, the first thing I did was I played piano. I had piano lessons. Then that led into I played guitar. Then that led into I acted for a long time. I actually acted with a super famous TikToker named Eliana Gann. One of my best friends was just on the phone with her today. Amazing human being. She has 10 million plus followers on TikTok. She's got over 500, 000, 500 million impressions overall. She then carried that over to be on her Instagram and everything. I'm going to be acting with her this Thursday. We're going to go on her TikTok live. I have no, I have no idea the implications of what that's going to be. But I was a Renaissance man. Acted in Jersey Boys. Acted in uh, American Idiot, which is like a Green Day musical. Always was a singer. I still sing house music industry. But unless you were a Renaissance man and appreciated the fine arts, if we don't appreciate fine arts, we don't have anything. Right? That's how I grew up. My grandfather was a doctor a uh, really, really brilliant doctor. My step-grandmother and him always went to the orchestra. I was raised on fine arts. There's a lot of people out there with a lot of money, a lot of different cultures. They do not know what that means. This is a fine art. Podcasting, what we're doing here is a fine art. And it's like, it's like inviting the jock on the show. He's going to show up wearing his football gear, kind of smelly, and go, hey, man, thanks for having me on. Yep, I, uh, I'm a lawyer now. And you're like, Oh, great. You're a lawyer. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I make a lot of money. Is this how you talk to girls too? Is this, is this how you flirt with girls too? Because this is horrible. I, you know, like you, you need to have a little more in the tank than you need to be creative with, with what you have to share. And, and if, you're, if you're stuck in that place, and I, I, I feel bad for people like that. They're stuck in it like a bad place where they have a career. They've worked it for maybe like 20 years and they're not happy. Like pick up a guitar. Like figure out what made you cool when you were like, what did you like or, to do? Or, or just leaning into what you're great at. And, and I don't want to, I, I don't want to sound like I'm coming off is bad mouthing people that, that don't know. They just, they just don't understand new media. But yeah. I, I say this because I hope that anybody that hears this, yeah. this clip, hears it, they will understand, you know what? Maybe it's worth springing. The, the, I'm telling you, you could buy a dope ass mic that plugs right into your laptop for like, 70 bucks. That's it. And you, you'll sound a uh, hundred X better. You don't yeah. have to get a $10,000 camera to start doing your media. You no. just need to, you just need to buy, like you said, buy the microphone. And this is something that you want to get into and you have the, 
conumption to call somebody and say, hey, I want to be on your show. You know, respect their art, respect their craft. It's like asking somebody to sit in on a gig. Hey, can I play bass for you next week? Yeah, show up and play bass really well and be excited about what I sing. Be excited and about the band. I don't I don't think you should go out and buy a ten thousand dollar mic. That's why, you know, I think it's funny when we you know, we were talking earlier about Meghan Merkel and Michelle Obama getting their Spotify deals canceled because you I don't think you need to spend millions and millions or even thousands or even necessarily hundreds of dollars before you even know what you're getting into. You yeah. know, I, I and, and and when I'm working with a new client, I really like to set an expectation up front about what we're trying to accomplish. I, podcasting is hard, right? Yeah. And I don't think anybody should get into this new media game because it's trendy or because they, they think they had this really fat thing story to tell or they want to get 100,000 downloads in the first year. Like, that's not the reason. The, the reason is you, you stay top of mind. You're building strategic connections with people. We're going to be doing business, right? We're, yeah. We've got, got we're, we're in alignment. Yeah. And without the podcast, without the media, without the studio, it, 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 it loses that panache. You also have the SEO on the back end. Now I've got stuff, uh, you know, if someone Googles me, I actually show up. When I first started podcasting, this is, this is pretty funny. I'd go to Google, I'd type in Mark Savant, and there's this attorney out in California or a doctor in California, Mark Savant, MD, love the name, by the way. That is all you could find. Yeah. You type in Mark Savant, you're getting MD, California, all through the first several pages of Google. I was a ghost. You could not find me anywhere. Five years into this, in as I've grown my brand, you don't see, he, I'm sorry, brother, he doesn't exist anymore. It's, it's me, it's my podcast with, you know, Paul Hutchinson, it's my podcast with you know, Neil Patel, with, with uh, Pat Flynn, with all these people. Isn't that great? That you my, like on the internet overtook somebody else who had like it's amazing. <laughs> he had a business and you overtook his name and it's like who's Mark Savant? Oh, I know Mark Savant. It's like no, I he's probably going through that right now over his lawyer practice. Like no, I'm Mark Savant. The, I'm the Mark Savant, not that guy. It's like no, I watch his podcast. Like that's crazy. You have the same name as Mark Savant with the podcast. <laughs> it also, you know, the, the other reason yeah. it's amazing is because I don't. You know, full disclosure, I don't know exactly what my blue ocean is going to be. I don't know what my million or $10 million idea is just yet. But I know by having that media presence, mm -hmm. I know because I'm showing up on Google, I know because my website ranks, mm -hmm. that when I'm ready to launch it, I've, I've got a Rolodex of a thousand people. Yeah. I've got the media infrastructure. I have the distribution. You have people to call. Editing. You have people to call and you have the right network for it. And I think just new media, we're talking new media, old media, right? Okay, what happened in Hollywood? What happened in Hollywood? Who made it to the top? People with talent. Like I've been in auditions before. I've auditioned for plays. I was always the lead. I I don't think I don't think I've ever auditioned for a play without getting a role like as as a main lead because I would just come in and sing or like somebody would know me and I had a reputation in the space for being really good for like low budget because I was just, you know, I wasn't doing big plays, right? But you have to have talent. You have to have the it factor. There's going to be a lot of people that pursue this type of work. They don't have the it factor. I think you have the it factor. I think you have, I think you have a look for it. I think your voice, I, I told you this at the vault. I think your voice is very good for over the mic. And I, I think that you have the right brain for it. You move very quick. When, when, like pe when I listen to you as a fan of podcasting, a fan of different voices and personalities, your voice moves very quick. And I think you can keep up in conversation very well. So I do think you have a really big future in the space. I think it's going to go super great and for you. Um, but at, at the, you know, I, I also think that as you work on these different elements of your show, you work on the scalability, you work at the business model, you work on topics, you bring in strategic partnerships with people like myself that maybe could connect you to X, Y, and Z. That's how the show is going to grow exponentially over time. And well, in a year or two years, I mean, who, who knows, you know? You're having you're, you're you're having some really big people on, dude. I've I've seen I've seen the episodes. You did something with Sean Cannell, right? Like recently, yeah, yeah. yeah. Had Sean Cannell on. Cannell, sorry, yeah. And it's in in it's funny. There's like a momentum that builds with great guests. I know this sounds obvious. I was able to get some pretty big guests just from the beginning. Yeah, but it starts to build momentum. The more guests that you have, the more other people won't want to come on this show too. They like, get excited. Oh, yeah. Oh, you had this they person, that person, and that person. And I, I'm, I'm, more of a, I'm more of like a strategic guest that you heard that I had like a good message and I, I know a lot of people and I know a lot of information. I, I think this, I think this episode is going to be really interesting to watch back and oh, wow, that was a good piece of strategy. Oh, for a podcaster, any podcaster could watch this that knows me or knows of me and go, 
holy cow, Don's got a lot of information to share with me about how he can scale it. I mean, I was on, I, I saw it. I saw it happen before my very eyes with Pat. And now I'm working with a guy, Alan, who, who literally films like, he filmed the entire Tate podcast one and two filmed the the Tom Brady uh, interview films all these all these guys to where now that he and I are team up teamed up in Vision X it's like what do we not know right what do we not know in this space yeah um it's like getting an opportunity to work for to work with or for James Cameron for two years as he was a producer director and and being that guy that kind of knows how James did his thing as he's as he, as he's growing so you know any any help or anything in you know continuing this whole thing that that you need. I, I'm here for you. I, I did want to give you something. I don't know where we're at with the time, but I did want to give you something as a gift because I'm really appreciative that you have me on. And I think this is also kind of like past always done this. So I'm trying to, you know, I mean, like that. but, uh, I recently, I recently just ordered, I was on the, the crazy, uh, zoom call that, uh, Hormozy had recently. Yeah, that was so I don't know if you've already got your book, but I just wanted to give this to you. If you already have your book, uh, you just yeah. give it back to me. <laughs> but I wanted to give you hundred M leads. Uh, Hormozy, Alex is a, I want to say he's a dear friend of mine. I've talked to him for about an hour over a zoom and I've been going back and forth with him for a while, but this guy changed my life a lot. I think that book will change yours significantly. I have a signed copy of his last book. It, this one's not signed, but a lot of info in there. And this will tell you how to scale everything. I think she's the best in the space when it comes to scalability besides Pat. And uh, I hope you read that. I hope it, I hope it grows your business exponentially, Pat. I appreciate, I appreciate it. Yeah. I was, I was actually on that call. Yeah. I did order books, but they haven't gotten here okay, yet. Well, I've been hey, like counting there, the days. There's, there's <laughs> another one to give to somebody else then, but. hundred million dollar offers was probably top. It, was, it might've been my favorite book of 2022. It's so good. It's um, the, the charts. And one of the things that I really like about hundred million dollar offers, which is why I'm, thank you, by the way, it was yeah. really thoughtful. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Is it's, it's not just reading and forgetting about it. It's actually, it's actually getting out a pen and paper and doing the freaking work. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 it's applying the concept in real time to your business, to your strategy. Um, yeah, I, I love what hormones are doing. So one of the things that did happen during that call too, was when he was starting to stack the value, doing the value stack, like, well, this is a thousand dollar value and this is a 597 value. And, yeah. and the whole chat started turning against him, like, sell out. He's going to try to sell yeah, us stuff. And then he like went to the last second. He's like, it's not for this value. It's free. And then everybody's like, oh my gosh, everybody's laughing. I was like, oh, no way. Like, we didn't even know what, what the rollout was going to be. We didn't even know what it was going to look like whatever this free product was that he had. And then you go to the website. If you don't know how to get to it, go to acquisitions.com, go on the website, go down to courses, click on, I'm, I'm, I'm such a huge fan of Alex and, and I love what he's doing. I've always loved what he's doing. When I was working at VT, um, I, I went to Andy Elliott's seminar and had the first one and all these guys, crazy guys, going crazy. And I'd never seen anything like it. And at the very, it, he had Bradley out there for the first time. And Brad was talking about this new up and coming entrepreneur that you couldn't believe how good he was. And, and he mentioned the book and he mentioned the guy's name. I didn't take a note. It happened really fast. I was like, I wonder what that book, I wonder what that guy's name was. It sounded really interesting. Who is he talking about? So I'm in the car with Ryan uh, Brunton, call out to, shout out to him. And he had the book on his, on his app. He had it on his uh, Audible. And I saw it sitting there. I was like, what is that book? And I, is that that guy, the guy that, that Brad was talking about? He's like, yeah, I already, I took a note and I downloaded it. And I'm like, dude, give me the book. So that's when I found out about Alex at that point. And then I, I got back to my desk at BT and I was like, I wonder, I had started reading 100M offers. I thought it was the coolest book ever. I started coming up with all these different ideas for value tainment, how I was going to change the product and you know, change the world with the new product design. And I had some interesting ideas for the company. And then uh, I had a couple of signed copies. I, I reached out to Alex and I said, hey man, I'm working for PBD. I would love to get a copy for him, maybe a copy for Mario, maybe a copy for myself. So I ended up gifting Pat a signed copy of the book and that's how I got to know Alex. And then we went back and forth for about a year, you know, just over text and IG. And then uh, after I left ET, we had a, we had a one hour Zoom call together and he's, he's a real deal. He's a really cool guy. Haven't, haven't talked to him since, but uh, yeah, he's super busy. I mean, how are you going to reach the guy, you know? I cannot wait to have Alex on the show. Yeah, because I'm, be I'm, I'm, oh, it's going to happen. He's, he's, yeah. so and 
this kind of what Alex has done that's so genius kind of harkens back to something we talked about earlier, mm-hmm. which is taking calmly held beliefs and flipping them on their head and yeah. saying eh, it's wrong. Because when you're starting off as an entrepreneur, when you're getting into getting fit and whatnot, you have this mindset of I can't eat out. Mm-hmm. I have to eat at home because eating at home is cheaper. And yeah. It's healthier and whatnot. Yeah. He's like, when I was when I was uh, starting gym launch. I was eating chicken nuggets, but they were all grilled, only grilled chicken nuggets. Yeah. I would go to Chick-fil-A and ask for 50 yeah. grilled chicken nuggets. Now I can save eight hours a day. Yeah. Because I don't have to do all the meal prep. Yeah, the meal prep and cooking and everything. And he's also, you know, workout enthusiast. He's also in that world, the, the gym world. So it, I, I do think that he has a lot of contrarian points that are, that are accurate. They're very accurate. Yeah. Um, a lot of people in the sales space will be like, You need to call, call, call. If you're not on the phone, what are you doing? Pick up the phone again. Dude, this guy with the lead magnet system and the marketing that he did and the rollout with the, with the, the four core, the, the core four, that implementable strategy in this book, you don't like, yeah, you can make calls, but if you do that, you're golden. You need to figure out your marketing and you need to get it really working and that'll sell the product for you. If you have a good product, if the marketing is not working and you put, $100,000 $100,000 on ad spend and show the product to the world and have the website looking good, but the people are still not buying. That means your product sucks. You have to go back and look at your product. And that's where the first book comes in, right? You right. know, it's, it's just amazing how, how his whole system works. And he's a, he's a genius. I really like him a lot. What, and the, the other thing I really liked about the first book was getting clear on how to explain your offer. Mm-hmm. How many times do you walk up to someone and say, hey, what do you do? And they're like, well, it's complicated. And you're like, here we go. Here we go. You got to be quick. You got to be okay. sharp. You got to be tight. And, and, and I'm not saying that happens overnight. It takes some time to get there. But now when people ask me what I do, I, say, I launch an automate podcast. Mm-hmm. I launch an automate podcast. You're a business owner. I'll launch and automate your podcast for you. And it's, it's clean. It's clear. People understand what it is. But that, that book helped me to get to that point. Also, side note on Hormozy. I'm planning on being Alex for Halloween, by the way. That's what I saw. That's what I'm for Halloween. And it's just, it's okay. I'll get the nose strip. Dude, that's great, man. I got the acquisition hat. I'm Dude, gonna I don't want to take that from you. As long as we go to different Halloween parties, I might do the same thing, bro. That's amazing. Like, <laughs> like the hair and the nose strip. I have the hat now. So, yeah, that'd be so good. Cut off sleeveless shirt. I have to hit the gym a lot more and, you know, and to be able to do that. But that's so funny, dude. That's great. Is, is your is your is your is your wife gonna be Layla? Or are you gonna no, I don't, get her to be Layla? I think like, her and my be daughter. This woman that you have no idea who she is. <laughs> I, but, but I tell you, she's like, who are you gonna be? What are you doing yeah. for all the way? I'm yeah. gonna be Alex Hormozzi. She's like, what is? And I showed her a picture, and she's like, oh, it's perfect. Because that's the second half. Is you got to be recognizable. You got to be different. Like, yeah. How can you be recognized? He, you know, he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. He's a wife beater and cut off jeans yeah. and Crocs. Yeah. It's like so brilliant. It's so brilliant. Which this is the thing that I think is interesting about Patrick Ben David is he's always dressed the T. He's always dressed like, in the nines. He's, a, he's the best looking dude in the room. Yeah, yeah. And that's a really popular model too. Tom but, Ford's his favorite suit if you ever get him a suit, just, you know. Fair. Tom fair. Ford, yeah. Uh-huh. Fair. You know, but, you know, I'm on this side note, although when I, when I left my day, day job one year ago, by the way, mm-hmm. such a freaking blessing. It took me a long time, but you leave your day job. It feels so good to be signing the front of the check and not the back of the check. I can't tell you how much better it feels. Um, but I had this kind of thing where I was like, I'm never wearing closed toe shoes again. I'm just going to wear flip-flops the rest of my life. I, I actually shut that down partially because of Pat. Yeah. Saying like, I don't like people wearing sandals around me. Well, it's, like a, it's like a business thing. Like if you go into the top of New York and you're in one of those executive studios and you like, you got to wear the... He's a big media guy, man. Pat's going to be one. Pat, it will be the biggest guy in media. I'm, I'm certain of it. Hundred um, yeah. percent. And and he's going to take over like a big top CEO position and sit there and have multiple locations in Brickell and Fort Lauderdale. He paint the picture for me a lot, but I can paint the picture for other people as well for what he's going to do. And that that's his persona. Now, yeah, finding your niche and how you dress and everything is cool, but like you got to be able to wear like a nice Ferragamo belt, a nice pair of shoes, a nice jacket, a nice suit. Get, get, get yourself a custom suit dealer. Go to, go to my boy, Mark Russell, man. I can't believe that that led into Mark Russell out of Palm beach. He makes amazing suits, the best custom suits for, um, all these top celebrities. He does, you know, the, the all the people in the UFC, he does a lot of people for local people that I know, but yeah, Mark is an amazing guy, a custom suit. I guess my great grandfather was a tailor. 
they, he went in and out of Paris to New York and Paris to New York. So I have a, an appreciation for that art. You know, it is, appreciate other people's arts. If you're an artist on podcast, appreciate the tailor, appreciate the people that are doing things that, that require that touch, you know, the real skill. I that, like, I like, you know, that. that was another thing I, I, I think is so cool about that event. The vault, I was keep talking about the vault conference because it's, I'm just, still I'm, like riding high on we're it. still living it. Yeah. But all, everyone is dressed nice. Mm -hmm. the, the, like nobody is slouching. The other thing I thought was really cool is if you were late, you're not getting in. No. He'd close the damn doors. Yeah. And you know, Last time we didn't even let people out for the bathroom. That got really, that got really tough. That's, it's a little dangerous. It's a little dangerous. <laughs> Although really I, I feel I was a little disappointed in myself because I drank a little bit too much before one of the uh, sessions. It was like a three hour session. And I, this was a big mistake I made. Big, big mistake. mistake. Big mistake. I, I drank too much before the session. It was after lunch. I mean, not a ton, but I drank, I drank too much water and coffee before the session. Yeah. And when the case study happened, I was like, okay. We're going to crank out the case study really fast. I'm going to go get in line so I can speak on the mic. And then I was like, as we were just wrapping up, I was like, I got to go to the bathroom first. I go to the bathroom. There's like 250 people out there. I was like, crap. So I had to like go find a bathroom. And by the time I got back, the line was so long, I couldn't get in front. And so next year, spoil yo, quick tip. Don't drink. And as soon as you get your answer for the case study, get to the front of the line. Get to the front of the line to get on the mic because I, I missed a huge opportunity to get to get some what, face what, time. What, uh, what section were you in the executive section or were you in the pot? What, what section were you? I was in general. I was just in general. Okay. General admission. Frankly, I wasn't even planning on going. Yeah. But no, my I, guy Jerry pushed me and, and I did. No, clearly, clearly. Because like if, if you had gone in the past, you would have bought. That, that's, a, that's just a first time goers ticket. Like. If you go once and you go in general, the next year, you're most likely going executive or founder or CEO. And I, I saw a lot of that when I was brokering the tickets that people started off general and the next year they're like, yo, I got to be up front. So executive, I feel like is a really good like middle ground like level to be because you're closer up to the mic, you get to go to the lunch, everything like that. But yeah, talk, talking about the tickets, yeah, you definitely being in, op, this is one of the things that I learned from Pat that I think is really important to share. The rule of the number two. Okay. And there's all these different ways that you can go around getting to the number two. This is one in one of our meetings that he shared this with me. The rule of the number two is you're going to have a number one that you want to contact and get in touch with. You're going to want to know who he is, get him on your show, whatever. Maybe it's you go super big and it's Elon, you go whoever it may be. Maybe you try to do a show with Lex Friedman, right? Maybe you're not able to reach the number one, but you got to find who his number two is. Yeah. If you find the number two, then at the time, maybe you even reach the number one, right? At the time that you make the introduction with the number one, he gets your name on paper. He says, who is this guy? He's going to go to his number two. It might be his wife. It may, you have to investigate. Who is his number two? His buddy, his business partner, his wife, whoever. Maybe his brother. He'll turn to the number two and say, hey, who is this guy? And they'll go, oh, I love him. Sat down with him. Had lunch with him. Great guy. Great topics. I think you'd be great to go on the show. Yeah. Okay, book it. If you don't know the number two, he doesn't know how to edify you. He doesn't know how to find out who you are. He doesn't have anybody that tr he, he trusted his inner circle. Pat's big inner circle guy that, that knows you. So you're not going to get in. It's all about the number two. And he's really good at identifying who the number two is. He's very, very methodical about connecting with people. That was another a really big takeaway from that event was I need to tighten up my inner circle. Uh -huh. I need to tighten up my inner circle. Like, uh -huh. I know a lot of people, we're friendly and we're friends, but we're not like talking on a regular basis about, hey, what are you doing? Where are you making moves? How, what do you think about this model? What about that tech? Like, I, I, I really feel like that's an important, that's an important piece that I, I can shore up in my own business. Um, and then the other thing, the, the other point was the accountability piece, right? Like, I loved that he was closing the door. If you were late, you're going to get locked out, which by the way, I almost got locked out during one of the sessions. Bathroom problem again. Like I should probably just not drink. I should probably just fast on water. Yeah. So I'm in the restroom. I'm, I'm looking good on time. I'm feeling good. I've got a few minutes and I'm about to walk out. And then one of the value reps walks in. Yeah. One of the value reps walks in and he's got a coffee. He goes, Hey, he, I don't know what, why you did, but he puts his coffee down and says, Hey, uh, um, um, could you watch my coffee for a minute? Just watch my coffee. And I'm thinking like, dude, you're taking a leak. And like, like the, the clock is ticking. And I said, oh, oh, okay, I'll watch it. Just don't make me late. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I also said, you know, he was one of the guys who was handling the mic. 
I was yeah. like, you know, if, give me the mic when the time comes up. And um, he goes, okay, I got you. I got you. I'm like, okay. And taking a while, taking a while, clock's ticking. I'm feeling like if I get locked <laughs> out, I'm going to freaking <laughs> flip out on this kid. And uh, eventually he gets, he gets rushed. I'm like, see it. I, I'm sprinting to the door. I barely make it in. Like they close it behind the girl behind me. Yeah. I get in, I find my seat. And I'm like, fool, good. But man, if I would have been five seconds later, I'd have been, I don't know. The other thing is there's like I, no I excuse. Don't, I don't know if I know the person that had you do that, but I never would have done that. Hey, can I, can you wash my coffee real quick? Yeah, while I go pee, can you wash my coffee? That's yeah, it's a little weird, but that's okay. There's Whatever. like no excuse good enough either. Yeah, no. Like the first day no. I was I rolled up a little bit late because I watched Mike. Well, why? Like why why are you watching his coffee? Can you tell you why you're watching his coffee? You I just know, said that. I don't know. Maybe he was, try, maybe, maybe he was trying to like, you know, connect with you because he knew who you were. He was trying maybe, maybe, but then he didn't try to like close you after, like get you off the side and talk to you, connect you again. Yeah, I talked Did to you him a little off? bit. I, I talked to him a little, not a little too Wait, then the clock was kicking. I was going to get locked down in the yeah. event. You're like, bye, buddy. See you later. I was, I'm literally sprinting. And I was talking <laughs> to the other guy, too. And he was like, he was, we were both kind of like feeling the pressure. We sprinting. Oh, my God. And I had this like kind of fantasy in my head that I walk in and, and Patrick turns his head. He's like, hey, yo, Mark, why are you late? And be like, buddy, well, buddy, was, why are you late, buddy? I was buddy. like, well, I was helping with this. And he'll be like, no excuse. I could have been like, I just performed CPR on the president and he lived. And he'd be like, but well, why are you late? You yeah. know, there's no excuse. Good up. I really, really like talking about accountability and how he, because he's a master at, at managing a room. He's been doing it for so many years through PHP. Part of what Pat is, is so amazing at is... And I think what has made him so amazing at what he does is that he's gotten so used to hosting the, the insurance meetings that that they do throughout that model where they get a bunch of people in a room and they talk to them that now this thing that is the vault is so easy for him. It's effortless because he's been yeah. doing this all his life. He's been doing this for the past 10, 12 years. That's where the public speaking thing comes in. Like prepare, like get ready, get get experienced in what you're doing now. So you can do it big leagues in the future and do it incrementally. Start small and then get, and then get bigger. When he told everybody, you know, the event's wrapping up, you know, they're going to do the pitch and it's coming near the end. And he told everybody, hey, listen, it wasn't near the end. It was, it was like, I think the, the third day or maybe second day, he was like, hey, if you're walking out now, just stay outside. Mm. Oh. And everybody, they were, they were walking. Like I, to be honest, I even had stood up because I'm like, I'm going to need to use the bathroom. And I, I sort of, I just got out of my seat. I heard him say that. And I was like acting like I had just, you know, messed up my camera. I need to like move. I was like, oh, I'm just moving around sort of thing. But people were walking. They, they beelined it back to their seat. People were like, no, no, no. You were already walking. Why don't you keep going outside? Mm. Then you're locked out. They got locked out for a pretty like serious thing. I think. I heard it's up After to that, 15, 20 minutes. I saw it. Was, I it was, got it was like, out. yeah, it was like, a, it was like a big thing that they had missed too, like at a pinnacle point of the event. But that's what happens. I mean, if you mess with the guy's event and you're, trying to go out and pee at, at a time where it's like, listen, I know you're going to get up when I start to talk about X, Y, and Z after such and such was out. It's, it's a disrespect. And, you know, it's yeah. all about respect. At the, the end of the day, it's all about respect. That account, the accountability struck me so hard because I have this, I work really well when my back's against the wall mm -hmm. and we're like, okay, nut up, Mark. It's time to go. Yeah. Buckle up, buttercup. Let's freaking get after it. But what'll happen is I'll have a few wins and I let off the gas and I'm, I'm, I cannot, I'm done with it. Mm -hmm. I'm freaking done. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing it. And I, I brought after the, after that show, after the event, I went back to the mastermind group that I lead. Shout out to all the after hours entrepreneurs out there. Nice. I'm and, and I'm like, listen, y'all, this group is going to be about accountability. If, if you're not up for it, this might not be the place. We have two goals. A, get clarity on where we're going and what steps we want to take. Yeah. And B, be ready to be accountable. Don't show up to a meeting in, in, without having accomplished what you said you were going to do. You were going to make 100 calls last week. Make the 100 calls. Mm -hmm. Because we want to be winners. Yeah. You know, that there's, there's too many. And I, I've suffered from this too, where... People come in and you don't want to offend. You want to be like, okay, well, you know, better luck. I'm, I'm done with that. You know, we're, we, we need to, if we're going to be successful, we need to actually put in the work. Yeah. And when I saw, when I felt the energy, when I saw the people that were winning, I said, this is what it's going to take. Yeah. This is what it's going to take. And it's not going to be a fit for everyone. And that's great. It doesn't motivate everyone. 
but I know what motivates me and I know the vibe that that is going to attract the tribe of killers that I that I want to surround myself with. And it was it was a really, I think, transformational moment for me. Um, and, and you know what you know what the group said? What? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Let's mm-hmm. freaking go. Let's yeah. go, Mark. People need more accountability. I mean, if the reason why people are attending masterminds is because they're looking up to you. That, that's the reason why they're there. They want to be more like you. They want to identify what makes you work. They want to identify how you've done what you've done. And so they want to be a part of your mastermind group. That, yeah. That's the reason why they're there. And the more that you give that enforcement, reinforcement about what you know, what you know to help them, the things that you've experienced, same thing with the podcast. They want to know that you know things, right? And what's cool about the whole podcasting world, as you do start this form of media, you get to meet people that know things and then be able to talk about the things that they know. So like my whole flow on the cast is things I know that I had the conversation with Andy, things I, you know, bumped into with Alex, all the knowledge that I have from Pat over the years, like in this notebook and all the other notebooks I have, it's just written out pages and pages of like just gold, right? Uh, it's all, also some of my old, oh, that's funny. I love seeing that. It's one of my old, uh, like closing, like all the, all the sales that I made. Cause I would take it. All these nice. old people. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Some really great people. Oh, is this, yeah, this is when, this is when Gus came to the, the BPW. Shout out to Gustavo, who's an amazing, uh, he's an amazing veteran, works in the NYPD, incredible guy. He was my number one client at VT, always supported my career there. Great guy. Great guy. Uh, on, on multiple occasions when I called him when I was in a competition, he said, uh, what do you need? I, I, if, if you're in a position in sales where you have a guy like that, that, that has your back, like you need to have their back. You need yeah. to make sure that whatever value that, that, that they paid for, the 10 Gs that they paid, they get 10X back. Mm-hmm. They get 100,000 in value. If you have a product and they buy it for 10 bucks, you need to make sure that that, that product has a $100 value. You need to make sure that's how you get them coming back. Right. A 10X, 10X uh, return. So, so yeah, the, the accountability yeah. for me was one of the major, major takeaways. The other, the other big takeaway for me, Don, was the freaking book, this yeah. freaking manual, dude. Yeah. I wasn't expecting this. There's a lot of work that goes into that. Every edition, each year, it gets much more in-depth, honed out. Information's great. You know, he has a very, very professional writer, Greg, who, who does... He he helps write this book. He's he's doing the next book, Choose Your Enemies Wisely. He also did your next five moves. Um, but he consults and, and writes a lot of this material. There's a full board that goes into this book. It was just shocking, you know, because normally when I go to events and they give you your swag bag, it's a bunch of advertisements for other stuff. Yeah. And I didn't, I, frankly, I didn't even look in the swag bag. I never look in the swag bag. Maybe yeah. I need to start. Because going to the event on the first day, I was wondering... Do I even need to bring this? You know, I'm going to be carrying around this book all day. I'm mm-hmm. gonna, it's going to be clunky. It's going to be hard to use. Why don't I just take notes on my phone? Yeah. And I'm so glad I brought it because it's just chock full of practical, tactical stuff that I, I, I can use. The, the other thing that I thought was funny, and I have to share this, is my kids were saying, hey, daddy, you know, we miss you. You've been gone for four days. You're like up at six. You're getting home at 11. We, you know, we miss you. When are you going to come home? I'm like, daddy's in school. Daddy's learning. And they're like, what are you, you're too old. You don't go to school anymore. And I'm like, I'll show you. And I come home and I'm flipping through the book and here's the homework and here's the schoolwork that I'm doing. It was really, it was really kind of a cool experience for them to see that we, we never stop learning. Pat, one of the big things in Pat's story is that he went to the, the Harvard uh, graduate business school program and he sat next to the guy that's the, the big guy that was like a owner in Victoria's Secret or was really high up in the company. He told the story, but it goes a little bit more in depth than that. That's where Pat took himself out as a CEO and learned from other CEOs. So I think that this book is very much inspired by that experience he had at Harvard. And that's why it's a true business, you know, school book. Like this is probably yeah. get more out of this than you would knowing yourself, knowing your moves. Uh, strategic partnerships, case studies, and all the pictures about manifestation and everything. This is probably one of the best educational books on the market. This one and this one. If you have, <laughs> if you have uh, Alex Ramosi and PVD on your side, you're pretty much you're pretty much good. You're in good shape. <laughs> and, and it's it is like you're being. And because people ask me, Mark, is it really worth going to Vault? Is that really the place you want to be? And I'm like, listen, that like you said, this is being taught. This is Harvard level. Yeah. business education, but being taught not by a university professor, 
it's being taught by one of the best entrepreneurs and business owners and, and business developers in the world. If, if you took if you took the amount of time that I had sitting with Pat in a room and being at VT working there, getting the opportunity to work with a with a giant like Pat and such a cool guy like Pat, it'd be worth like seven point five million dollars if you if you evaluated right. my time there. Great. Like and in the fact that I got a ticket for five hundred bucks, it's obscene. Yeah, it's yeah obscene. it's obscene. It is obscene. It's obscene. Yeah. Uh, Don, this has been dope AF. Where's the best place we can find you? Yeah, the best place to find me would be on Instagram. I do a lot of my stuff on Instagram. Don the producer underscore at Don the producer underscore. But I did want to show you something because it might might help you out too. There's a company, I met the CEO uh, and a couple of the founders at the event called Link Me. And this is how I'm going to do all of my stuff from now on. So it's just your entire portfolio on an app. It has a QR uh, code um, a scannable function. You can also share your contact with people. But right here, I have my my Instagram. Boom. I have my, oh, that's one of the guys I work with. Um, LinkedIn. Boom. Right here. My LinkedIn. My Manek. This is where I do all my consulting. You can uh, book time with me on here and consult with me. So also you can find me on Manek. Don Cappy. It's an application on the on the, the app store. And then also it shows all my stuff that I did with Vinny when I was at VT, they put on here, it's all my, all my YouTube and everything. You can get a customizable one sent out to you, but all, all the, all the pictures, me and Theo Vaughn, me and Jordan Peterson, everything's integrated into one app. I think linked me is going to be the next big social media company. I really do. Yeah. Like almost on a Facebook level. Cause this is amazing for networking. It's it amazing. Looks, it's so beautiful. It's yeah. basically link tree, except it looks good. Yeah. It, it's, it's beautiful. And the thing and, and we're ta- I was talking about this the other day. I typically use Hi Hello yeah. as my digital business card, mm-hmm. but it, it doesn't have the same panache. It's not as brilliant and vibrant as this. The, the other thing that I hope they can sort out is making it easier to get people's contact info. There were definitely people that I met yeah. that didn't finish the final steps of connecting. So when you're using Hi Hello, they scan the QR code, they add you to their contacts, but there's another step where they have to type in their name an email to send me their info. Yeah, it's a it's an additional step. See, you can see right here, boom. This is Pat's gone. It's his link me. It's all of all of his stuff here. His has integrated with the stores. That's what the guy showed me. I'm like, well, if Pat has it, I'm gonna get it done. Like I don't even need to think another second about that. And then also, yeah, uh visionxmedia.io. Go to the website, check out some of the uh portfolio. The portfolio will also be on there of a lot of the work that Alan's done over the years. And if you need to, you know, reach out to me, do it over um, Instagram, social media, whatever, and we'll get in touch. And yeah, I'd love to talk to everybody about Vision X, what I can do for them, what we can do for them. And uh, also on the consulting side that we kind of tapped into during the interview about what can be done in your media operation, I can help there too. I love what y'all are doing with media in South Florida. South Florida is the place, y'all. It is. I don't know what to tell you. South Florida is where it's happening. It's on and popping. It's hot. It's sexy. This is where you need to be for media. Don, thanks for being here on the show, bro. Thank you so much, brother. Appreciate it.